Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to our Lessons from the Cutting Room Floor. This is Black History Month, so we're doing things a little different. Last week, we talked about the law, seeing black history through the lens of the law, and I hope you learned a lot. In fact, it was so good, and so many persons responded to what it meant to them and what it introduced them to, that we're going to do some follow-ups to that, because there is so much more to learn. Tonight, we're taking a different direction. 50 years ago, I had the privilege of standing in the New Shiloh Baptist Church, Dr. Harold A. Carter, senior pastor, and delivering my initial sermon. It seems like just yesterday in some ways and seems like forever in others. I remember that night as I walked up the back steps to go into the pulpit, and I heard the voice in my head say, you better run down these steps and run out of these churches as fast as you can. And I heard the voice of the Spirit say, if you do, I'll break both your legs. And I went to the desk, and I preached my 11-minute sermon. And for the next 50 years, these 50 years that have passed, I've tried to improve upon the effort that I gave that night. Aware of all of the things that have changed in our world, and all the things that have changed in my world in those 50 years. Preaching has changed. People have changed, but the Word of God stands forever. In New Psalmist, we take great delight in working to make sure that anyone who stands here to present God's Word has a deep love for God and appreciation for His Word. With all the things that are coming up this month, I didn't think it robbery that we pause for a moment and talk about it. In fact, this coming Friday night, and I want you to tomorrow night to be up here on the site because we're having movie night tomorrow night. That's right. As part of our African-American history experience, we are having the movie Till, we're having Pride, we're having Selma. It's going to be something for everybody. Three movies, yes, we're on Movie Palace tomorrow night. You can come bring the whole family. The concession stand will open around 6.30, and then we'll have the movies showing. Everybody is going to have a good time. You don't have to be a member of New Psalmist to share in this. We just want you to come out and fellowship together and learn something about the journey we have had. I've had a unique journey for 50 years. The privilege of preaching the gospel, but the privilege of growing in the gospel the privilege of learning how to preach. Every Sunday I stand, I'm learning again how to preach. And I've invited tonight some of our preachers to share and to discuss with me and to ask questions about the 50-year journey of preaching, about the development of sermons, about the experiences that were taking place in those 50 years how sermons are shaped out of the crucible of our own human interactions. And they're going to share with us and share with you the questions that are on their heart and I hope that are in your mind. And I hope that the answers will somehow bless your life. If you know someone who is a preacher, send them a text. Tell them to come on over, join in the conversation because it's going to be a stimulating conversation. So let me take a moment to introduce or have them introduce to, to themselves to you tonight about those who are sharing with us. Darius, would you start letting the people know who you are? Good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Darius Smith, and I work with the ministers in training here at New Psalmist Baptist Church for the last 25 or so years. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cheryl Banks, and I am one of the newest associate ministers here at New Psalmist. I've been preaching for about two years now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Stewart. I'm a new minister as well, and I've been preaching for a couple of months. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Devron McLeod, and I have been preaching for about 12 years now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reverend Ojeda Hall France. And I've been preaching for about 18 years now, and I'm excited to be here and celebrate your 50th anniversary of preaching, Bishop. And I'm Minister Lindell Smith. I came to New Psalmist as a licensed minister in 2012. I preached my initial sermon in 2010, and 
and so I've been preaching for about 12 years as well. As you can see, we have a great panel of preachers here from our newest to some of our oldest, but all excited about the opportunity to preach and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. In a sense, I came into each of their lives at a different period, at a different time. I guess the one I've known the longest is Devron. Devron, how long have I known you? And when would you say, because you've been here forever, when would you say <laughs> preaching took a new meaning for you? And what was that? Well, Bishop, you have known me since birth, um, having a great connection with the families. And sitting from Franklin and Cathedral up to Old Frederick Road, I believe that's when it really hit me. I think that was when I was going through that transition of teenagehood, if you will, trying to figure out myself, trying to figure out this life, trying to figure out my purpose. But it was the word that kept coming from the pulpit that kept convicting me and, and making me search within and saying, there is something greater for you to do. I don't know. And then it was like, God, I don't know what that is. And even running from it, you know, we talking several times and <laughs> running from it, and it just resonated. I would say about 15, I'll be honest with you, 15, when I was 15 years old, hearing the word come from the pulpit with such authority and really transforming my life. And then about 19 or 20, actually listening to that voice and that call and finally preaching when I was in my 30s, and it has changed my life been such a, and then enjoying this journey, to be honest with you. Wow. Darius, I remember when you were a student at Howard. Tell me, talk about when, when the ministry here and the gospel here hit you. Gospel and ministry at New Psalmist hit me about, um, it's been about 25 to 30 years ago. I was at a dark place in my life struggling with some um, relationship issues and um, I came to New Psalmist invited by a friend and did not recognize that when I came to New Psalmist I came during the month of family month. Bishop was preaching a sermon that particular Sunday Bishop and it sounded to me as as a trained minister myself, it sounded like you were in my home, that you knew all of what I was going through. Um, the sermon had my name on it. So I came back the second Sunday, family month, Sunday number two. Same identical situation. The sermon, the content of the sermon spoke directly to my spiritual being, spoke directly to my emotional state. And I left the church that Sunday and I was determined on my way home that I wasn't coming back the third Sunday because two Sundays of Bishop being in my business <laughs> was enough. So I said to myself, I'm coming the fourth Sunday if the sermon touches me in a way that it had for sermon number one and two, then I was going to take that as a sign from God that New Psalmist was the place I needed to be planted. I came to New Psalmist on the fourth Sunday in the month of family. I believe it was September. Number three sermon spoke to my core, spoke to where I was at the time in my life without any thought. When the doors of the church were open, I got up and walked down the aisle. Mind you, I was serving and had been serving in another church for about 10 years I had no conversation with my former pastor at all. I am standing at the front of the church, giving my life to Christ to join New Psalmist. 
And from that day on, it has been just spiritual bliss for me being under your leadership. And you have blessed me in more ways than I'm able to articulate in our time together. The person I've known next the longest is Christopher. I've known his family forever. Chris, when did all this become real to you and what made the gospel here trigger something? Honestly, Bishop, it's been like stages in my life. Um, I remember I was in high school and I was struggling trying to fit in. Um, I've always kind of been in my own lane, done my own thing. And I'm struggling with this side of me that my parents and my grandparents put in me of the foundation of faith and the church. But the people that I'm around aren't as spiritual as me. So well, I'm, some of us know those. <laughs> I'm struggling with that. And this was at the old church. Um, I, I heard one of your sermons and I'm like, wow, like you spoke right to my situation, right to where I was dealing with what I'm. I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that, trying to understand my identity. And then I was like, all right, maybe I should maybe transition from the mocks and be in security and not really being <laughs> in a sermon, just doing security around to actually listening to more of your sermons. So that was when I made the first transition to, okay, I actually want to hear the word for the first time in my life. Um, and then progressing, 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 we get to me getting rebaptized in 2018. And that is when I made the decision, God, I'm going to live for you. All the sermons, the discipleship classes, everything was coming together to tell me exactly who I am. And that's when I say, okay, God, I'm committed. From this point on, I will go forward the way you want me to. And then right after that, <laughs> the Bishops, T.D. Jakes, Pastors and Leaders Conference. That's when I said, okay, God, it's, I see what you're doing in my life, but now it's real for me. That conference changed my life. And to this day, I hang the, the lanyard that I got from that conference in my car because it's a constant reminder of where God is, is continuing to direct me. And from there, it was, okay, Bishop, I have to send you a letter telling you that I, I love this thing called ministry. I want to be a part of it. I don't know what God's going to do with me, but I'm open to everything he wants to do with me. So now we get to my initial sermon <laughs> last year, and that was just amazing to, to finally get there because it took me a while to get there. Work has always been trying to, trying to find that balance of I want to be successful on the job, but I also love God. You know, I, I want to be a part of ministry, and I don't like missing out on things. So it's a, it's a constant, okay, I know what you're trying to do, God. And I'm gonna, everything else is going to be silent, but now I know exactly where I want to be in ministry. And your sermons are hitting harder now that I'm a preacher, now that I'm a oh, minister. Okay. It's like I'm, I'm taking it and saying, how do you do this so well? Like, it's amazing to know the best bishop on the world, the best oh, pastor. So, yes, it's been a, a lovely journey. <laughs> wow. Well, let me, before I get to the couple, let me go to one potato, potato salad. <laughs> Reverend Minister Cheryl. Cheryl, oh, and for those of you who are wondering, what am I saying? Cheryl uh, helped all of us realize the economy of cooking. That if it's only one person, you don't need 20 potatoes to make potato salad. You only need one. Cheryl, when, did, when would you say this ministry um, came alive in, in you? So many people may not know this, but I joined New Psalmist in 2006, fresh out of college. Don't let anybody tell you differently, but I'm still 22 years old. Do the math another time. And I had this understanding that God spoke to me in October and only in October. So I'm in church and a friend invited me, visited. Oh, I love this. This is fun. This is nice. I came back, and I kept coming back. So this was in October. So I said, they don't play the same songs back to back. If they play a song, that means God is speaking to me, and I'm going to join this church. Well, they played the song. I, oh, I got to walk down and join the church. Now, that never happens, 
but music ministers to me in a unique way. So I kept coming to church, kept coming to church, and in October 2010, I bought my first home. Well, right around the corner from the old church. It was, and then the new church opened. So I think God said, okay, in your world, I spoke to you in October, you have this new house, now, are you going to drive to this new location for church? So I kept driving, kept coming, but I was just a member. And then you made a call to serve. And I said, all right, Lord, it's New Year's Eve. I'm in church. I'm 25 years old. Mind your business, I'm age now. And in that process, I said, this is a new experience for me. Because it wasn't, oh, I'm serving just for the sake of being seen. It was building community. It was understanding the gospel. It was building a new experience with what my faith was. Transition a few years later, I've gone through discipleship. I've completed leadership. And I said, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit down and hang out and chill for a moment because I've been in school, school, school. Next thing I know, I'm sitting with you telling you that I believe I've been called to preach. And you asked me some questions. And I answered your questions, but I realized that the presence of God didn't only show up in October. He had been there nonstop. And your preaching has impacted and influenced me that I can take a nugget, I can take a bigger piece of chicken and give it out to others to say, this is where you are. Oh, by the way, you should check out my bishop. Oh, here's a YouTube link. Oh, here's a, a, a piece of sermon that I can post on my social media to introduce other people to the gospel because you've made it so relatable and so realistic for where individuals are at any given point in time in their life. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, we got a couple on this side. Pete and Jada, you all talk. Tell us how it came in about for you. How did this, how did the gospel here open something for you? Well, I, well I'll start. Um, I, uh, I've always, um, for most of my adult life, I've been familiar with you, who you are. We lived on the same street for a while um, and in my 20s. And so... Um, I you was drawn to the uh, citywide services that used to do, yeah. and so I began coming to those every year. You know how long ago that's been. Yes. Um, and so I knew of New Psalmist. I knew of uh, Pastor Thomas. I knew of um, the impact he had as a preacher because I had followed him, but I was in another. I was in a Catholic church at the time and subsequently became a member of another church um, and ended up coming here uh, only to be a member, not to um, participate in ministry. And um, a couple things happened. One was I sat right up in the top in the balcony. One was the Sunday that I came and you simply spoke directly to me that you were waiting for me. And so... I took that as my invitation to join the church. I too was at another church, but not not growing at all it, to, to the extent I thought I needed to grow. And so I needed to be rescued from that uh, situation, I felt. And then I joined and I only wanted to then work with, be part of the men's group. I didn't want to do, um, I didn't want to lead anything. I wanted to just, you know, just do something different because ministry Ministry had become hard for me, uh, had become, the work of ministry had become difficult. And so um, shortly thereafter, we had a conversation. I sent you a letter, and you said to me, well, don't do all that. You don't want to do all that. Just go and hang out with Darius for a while. And I sat down with Darius in sermon preparation. Um, he and I went through that, pro well, I went to his classes, and uh, I decided, we decided I would do another initial sermon. And so that's what I did. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't, but I decided to experience the relationship that I had with you and then the subsequent 
relationship, friendship, brotherhood I developed with, with Reverend Darius was just profound. And so I find myself now leading, uh, trying to do as much as I can in the kingdom to give back and, and, to, and to show God the glory that I have for the ministry. Reverend O.J. Bishop. Oh, uh, thank you so much for being able to sit in your presence right now at your yes. feet. This is incredible, an incredible opportunity for all of us. I, the word that comes to mind when I think about where I was is broken. I came to New Psalmist in 2012. It wasn't my first time. I lived in New York, in Brooklyn, and actually in Brooklyn thought I heard great preaching. I, I was from Brown Memorial Baptist Church, Sam Austin, um, but I didn't hear, and, and I heard great preaching when I came and listened to you. We would sit up in the balcony on Old Frederick Road, and I was convinced I could listen to you for one hour, two hours, three hours. As long as you wanted to preach, I was going to be like this. And I think you were speaking to a broken place inside of me that's really been broken for a long time. I can think of my family breaking when I was a young girl, two great parents, parents who I loved, who loved me, um, but divorced. We moved to, to New, we moved to New York, and something has been broken my whole life. And I found a lot of it in working with young people in New York and Brooklyn and as a youth minister. I felt that young people are often not heard, and I wanted to do the kind of ministry that elevated and amplified their voices. Um, and that was healing for me, but I was still broken. Um, and every Sunday, first of all, I said I was never joining this church because it was too big. But you make it small, and you design a ministry where you can plug in, and it feels like a family. And I was sitting as far from ministry when I came to Baltimore, and I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly. I had given up on ministry, and I, was, I felt I had gained 10 pounds. I got divorced. I lost a job. And the only reason I was in this church is because this is where my father found his home. And I sat way in the back as far from ministry as I could. I sat myself down, thought God was done with me, was ashamed, um, been divorced. And I was like, this is a shameful, just sit in the back. But you preached me forward a little bit every day. And you preached me out of pain a little bit every day. And then what kicked in for me is I'm a scholar. I am a student of preaching. And so what I want to know and what I've wanted to know is, how you think about God, how you talk about God. I've watched you unfold sermons. My husband will write your sermons word for word. I'm trying to understand the through line in your preaching because it has broken uh, chains for me over the years. It's interesting that you raise that, the through line. In preaching, we, there's a term we use. It's called the hermeneutic. What is the foundational principle by which you live, by which you read scripture, by which you try to present the gospel? For me, that is caught up in the wonder, the awe, and the mystery of God. The lens through which I see everything as I'm preaching, as I'm seeking to live and minister is out of, as my teacher in seminary, Dr. Leon Wright would say, that the heavens are open. Remember in, in Mark, when Jesus is baptized, it says, and the heavens were open and the spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And the voice was heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But that imagery of the heavens open, um, my, my New Testament professor used to say to us, you minister with the heavens open. And that is the lens through which I see everything. I see scripture. Um, it is never locked behind a door. It is always an open door. So that whatever I'm preaching, I'm preaching into, not just out of. I'm preaching into. Not only am I preaching folk into it, I'm preaching into it. Wow. So that if the preach, if, if I'm going into it, it's, pre it's creating the draft that's bringing everybody else with me. 
so that the heavens are always open. That's so that I'm not going to be heavily a doctrinal preacher or um, um, a systematic preacher. I'm going to be talking about life. You're going to find life in this sermon I'm preaching. You're going to see, you're going to see people. It's going to be a movie. It's going to be a movie, and prayerfully it'll have you on the edge of the seat. Bishop, to your point, you said you have people sitting on your seat, and I know you constantly say that you are a narrative preacher. Could you explain exactly your process? I know you say you like to be the film director, but could you take us down that journey of you and your sermon prep of being that narrative preacher of the director of a sermon that you would preach? Oh, okay. Narrative is story. And life is nothing but a story. You know, when you sum up, I used to watch this show, Big Brother House, you know, and all it is is stories in the house. And then one day it hit me and said, you know, you're looking at that, talking about how crazy these people are in this house. But this house is a microcosm of life because all of us are living stories. It's just so that we are the, we are the lead actor or actress in our story. And our story is reality. So when I'm reading the scriptures, I know that the stories of others are the stories of us. The experiences of others are the experiences that we have. And so when I look at the, the text, let's just say um, Samuel is coming to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel. Oh, that's a movie for me. <laughs> because as you know, I, you know, I love television, I love uh, movies because they tell stories. A story has three composites or three components. Character, setting, and incidents. The character is the people that operate in it. The setting, what is the time? What is the period? Where is it taking place? What are, what's growing on the ground? What's happening in the house? That's the setting. Then the incident. What is the thing that's happening? What is the, what is the thing that changed everything? that brought the character out of the field into the house. And there's always a tension between some aspects in the story. There's a tension between the character and the setting. Like Gulliver in the land of the Lilliputians. There's a tension between um, the incident, come see, come see Samuel. I want to see your sons and the characters. All these sons, but one is excluded. There's always a tension. And so my question is, whenever I'm reading the scripture, is not to look for, as some would do, the global philosophical truth. Because that's not who I am. I'm looking to see whose story I want to tell. Because there's Samuel's story. He's coming to town looking for somebody. What's it like? What's it like to not have a clue about what you're going to find, but you know somebody sent you to look for something? I could talk about Jesse. How do you feel when the most important man is coming to your house? How do you prepare for this? I can talk about David. So I'm going to look to see whose story today do I want to tell? Because that scripture, I could preach that for a month and tell somebody else's story. I could talk about different settings. I could talk about David in the fields, keeping watch of his sheep. I can talk about Samuel um, walk coming from where he was to where he is. I can do another sermon on um, Jesse cleaning his house. And I can do a sermon on how come there ain't no mother? You'll never read about a mother. So the I'm, first thing I'm going to do, Devron, is sit and say, whose story I want to tell? Because in telling that story, I'm telling somebody's story sitting out in the congregation. Yeah. I'm, 
And here's, here's, here's the incident. Samuel's come into my house, to Jesse's house, and he says, can you have your sons? And, and Samuel tells every son to come but Jesse. Uh, but rather, or Jesse tells every son to come but David. Every son to come to meet the man of God, the most important man in that, that region. I mean, he is the big preacher. <laughs> and your father leaves you out in the field, stinking with the sheep, and doesn't invite you. What's it like to have your father reject you? What's it like to have your brothers and sisters, your brothers elevated and you ignored? What's it like to have everybody else have something and you not get something? To be different. Why does my dad see me different? And there's a later story when he kills Goliath and Saul asks this question. Who is his father? Now remember how he feels about his father. But Saul realizes he can't be who he is unless his father has put something in him. And David is missing what his father's put in him because of the incident that's happening right now. My father is not thinking about it. How do you get dressed to come to the party you're not invited to? And I know people in the congregation who be living that. So that's how that, that's my process. I'm going to see what movie I'm going to get. Christopher, you look like you got a question to jump yeah, in with it. And, and it's going off of this narrating that you do. Um, my question, because you've been preaching for 50 years, and like Cheryl said, you've always been relatable. Your sermons have always hit our streets, each and every one of us. So my question is, over these 50 years, when it comes to like social media, current events, things that are happening with the people in the congregation at this time, at that time, how significant do you think it is to be current when it comes to writing sermons, when it comes to preaching? How significant do you think it is to be current on what's going on in the world? I like the way you put that. There's a difference between preaching current events and being current. Preaching pre current events is talking about what happened today, tomorrow, yesterday. And all of that has its place to help people understand the context. But preaching current is to understand how all of the events that are happening shape the current person that's in front of you. So that I can never preach to people without an awareness of the realities in which they're living. Those realities are informed by events, but the events themselves began to shape the person's thinking. So I am not going to dwell on the event. I'm going to dwell on how their thinking and spiritual development has been shaped. I want to reshape that because I can't change history. Does that make sense? I want them to rethink and revisit their, the way they have concluded reality, yeah. which has been shaped by the current events. I can't change those. Those are historical moments. They have happened, but I can change the way you see them. I can change their effect. I cannot change that Jesus was nailed to the cross, but I can change you from thinking that is the most horrific moment into believing that's the greatest salvific action. Yes, Cheryl. Cheryl. In that same line of thinking, you are shaping people. There is a sense of pride that comes from being black, from having a pastor that speaks to who you are and your importance in Christ. How do you weave 
presenting your blackness, having preached and traveled and ministered around the world to individuals that may not fully understand what blackness is and how it relates to the gospel? Because I accept as fundamental that I am black. It is not something I grow into. It is not something I put on from the closet. It is who I came into this reality as. It is, it is the will of God concerning me. You know, it is the will of God that's concerning that I was born a black man. My only, my only ways of understanding are through lenses that are shaped by the experience I've had. I cannot see the world through another lens because those glasses don't fit on my face. They don't fit. I mean, I remember my bus being bricked and stoned as it rolled out of Cherry Hill. I remember my seventh grade teacher watching me run down the corridor of the school uh, after riding two hours every day to get to school in the morning and watched him hold the door. And as I ran, he shut the door until, it got, until I got to the door and he finally pulled it to which meant I had to go to detention and would miss my bus going home. I remember walking home from Garrison Junior High to Cherry Hill. That's a long walk. Wow. I remember, I remember the racial injustices. I remember driving while black and being pulled over on the side of the road. I have no, I have no desire and I have no ability to divorce myself of that history. That history helps me understand the magnanimous grace of God and the power of God to overcome anything that God could have me born and grow up in those realities and bring me to a place of his effectuation blows my mind. And I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. I don't, I don't want to talk about collards and chitterlings. <laughs> Pete? Yeah, I, I just want to ask, um, when you said, you made this comment that in, in preaching your initial sermon, you felt that you had said all that there needed to be said. Uh, and so some 2,500 sermons later, <laughs> Um, wh where do you, wh where do you get the, 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 the notion about what it is that you feel most prevalent that needs to be said across the pulpit? Um, I believe God's truth is like a river. Um, most, I think many of us are looking for a truth and looking for the truth. But I believe God's truth is a river. It is beyond the truth. Everything is teeming in it, swimming in it. I'm not looking for, for one truth and, and one idea. Once I get in, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of our God. Once I'm in that, truth is just all around me. And I get to choose which one. There's some days... And see, I believe in revelation. I really believe in the mystery, the awe, and the wonder of God. That the God we serve and the God who calls us, calls us into this amazing mystery where we are exposed to the the almost unbelievable as it relates to us being able to tap into it. A consciousness that takes us beyond ourselves and allows us to give interpretation to what we have not even been able to understand in such a way that other people can have an aha moment and go, yeah. <laughs> and so for me, I don't know what what I'm going to find as I'm swimming in the river. But whatever it is, it's going to cook good for Sunday. 
You know, it might be a porgy this week. Might be catfish next week. Might be lake trout week after next. But with the right preparation, all folk will say is, that's just what I needed. I believe the truth of God is like a river. And whenever we're in it, we are supplying what people need at that moment. If I look for the truth they need, I'll never find it. Because folk will say to me, you were preaching right to me, and I do not know what in the world I was saying that spoke right to them. Because I wasn't, I may have been trying to catch bass. And they talking about pickerel. So I just swim in the river. My, my. Makes sense. My, my. Yes. And I guess I, I just have a quick follow-up question. When it comes to your devotional life versus, especially for a new preacher, when you're trying to just give God his time versus, okay, I want to prepare another sermon. And I, I, I hear you what you're saying, just swimming in a river. But I guess I'm still trying to understand that, that balance of, God, I'm going to give you the devotional time where I'm not going to the Word looking for a sermon, but I just want to go to the Word because I want to hear what you have to say in the Word. So... As a preacher that of 50 years. That takes a little development. Okay. Because the human part of us always wants to be ready and prepared. We are taught to be ready and prepared. And so for that, we think we must find the sermon. And we'll dress it up churchy-wise. Find the sermon God wants me to preach. <laughs> Every passage in the Bible preaches. You just got to be willing to put the work in with it. But here's, here's, for me, devotional life is, is life. This is devotion. Mm. I don't enter this moment as me. I enter this moment with God and me. He is very much my present help mm. in time of trouble. I'm not, there is no moment that's not devotional for me. Even when I'm in a whacked out crazy moment. I may be doing something whacked and crazy. It's devotional because that's how I get saved out of it. If you want to get saved out of it, every moment has to be devotional. And understand what that means. Devoted to. There is no, I don't have devotions at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't have devotions where that every day look like they did the day before. My devotional moments are every moment. I never leave them. I'm doing some other stuff. I may not be absolutely focused in it, but I'm not, I don't have to go and re reconnect with God. Mm, no, I'm not doing that. Because the life I live, I don't need reconnections. I need a steady flow. An on-off switch maybe, yes, but not reconnections. I need to... Somebody may ask me a question. I need not my answer, but his. And so I don't need to have to sink back into my thou and thee moment. No, I need to be able to be a vessel for him to speak through. And the, one of the ways I do that is by accepting that my reality exists within his. His doesn't exist within mine. Bishop, can I ask on that note, and I hadn't planned to ask this, but the relationship between music and preaching for you, when I think about Bishop Thomas, I think about a lot of things, but and when I think about your pastoring, I think about your love for worship. In fact, the day I joined the church, I think in 2012, you didn't preach the spirit was so high, you just flowed in the spirit of worship. And I, similar to Cheryl, said, I'm not joining this church, I'm not joining this church. Well, God's gonna have to speak to me specifically and I said, well, if, if, if my favorite song, you know, comes we in. We all have our thing. And you, and, and you were up here, and there is none like you, which is my favorite song. And we sang it. it. We sang it. So I, I wanted, wanted you to talk about the relationship between music and preaching for you. I love, somebody said, well, he loves certain kinds of music. I love all good music. I love music. There's no if and buts about it. I'll play the organ or the piano, but I only play for myself. I never play for people. I play for my own personal enjoyment. That belongs to me. 
I love worship music and what, what happens in worship. And I, I always figure as pastor, and this is not a preacher's thing, this is a pastor's thing. I am the chief worship leader. Yeah. As pastor. We have all these other people doing their thing. And they, they, sometimes they may think that they're doing more, but I don't have them. No, 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 baby. <laughs> because my concept, I am, in, I am responsible for the vehicle that takes people to God's house. No, to God's presence. I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for how we get there. And sometimes the tires are, need air. Sometimes the car needs ventilation. Sometimes I got to rearrange the seats because the people are sitting wrong in the, in the car. But I'm responsible for them getting to God and getting there so God can minister to them. He's given me that responsibility. He can do it himself, but he's given me that responsibility. I delegate it to others in certain roles, to the ushers, to the mops, to the this, to the that, to the choir directors, to the organists, to, the, to all play a part in that. But ultimately, it's my responsibility. I, said, I say to the music staff and the choirs, and I've said this to them plenty of times, I come prepared to die, to lay it all out. If you all do well, I don't have to. But I come to do the heavy lifting. Have no doubt in your mind. I come to do the heavy lifting. If you do yours, I don't have to. But if you mistreat somebody on the parking lot, I, I come prepared to cover that. If you don't treat folk right, get them seats. I come prepared to cover that. If you got the wrong songs, I come prepared to cover that. Because that's my responsibility. And I'm still going to preach that sermon. Because that's also my responsibility. For me, creating the atmosphere is one of the most exciting experiences that you can have. To be able to help people to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. It's not, I'm not blowing smoke when I say this is a cocoon. And my job is to make sure you know you're in it. So you, you can go through the transformative process. You can hear better here if the atmosphere is right. And so my job is to make sure the atmosphere is right. And in our African-American experience, music plays such a role in that. Yeah. You know, and especially chords play certain roles. Certain open chords and closed chords speak to the spirit differently. Certain notes and intonations speak differently. Certain riffs and whatever speak differently. So I'm aware of that. I'm aware of capabilities. What sounds are capable so that they can do what needs to be done in the congregation. I'm not just going to read preaching books or just um, study preaching. I'm going to study worship. I'm going to understand. I'm going to, I listen for hours to music. If I were to show you my phone now and my playlist, I have songs we've never sung just listed out that, that in my mind do stuff. And on Sunday mornings, a lot of times before service, I'm teaching them to the choir. I'm teaching them to the choir to learn them because they will help create the mood. So, Bishop, what, what I hear you saying is this doesn't start Sunday morning. Oh, no. no, no. So having said that in studying, Dr. Howard Thurman and Dr. Martin Luther King said the importance of preaching is also having a critical prayer life. In order to hear those strings that you're talking about and hearing this and being in tune with the spirit, it happens way before Sunday morning. 
Yes. So could you, ex how important is the prayer life as well in, in a preacher's life? Could you explain and talk about that? A lot of our, well, in discipleship, I guess we still teach this. Do you, do, we still learn acts, um, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. A lot of our prayer life centers around supplication. What we're asking God for, the S. <laughs> All the way at the end. All the way at the end of the prayer chain. We spend the most time, God, can you give me five hours? Um, but Jesus didn't start there. He started with our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And when you just raise your eyebrows saying, hallowed be thy name. You just get to think about the God who saved you. The God who, oh God, I wish you were old enough to have been broke. The God who delivered us when we were broke. The God who rescued us from racism. Because some of us remember when racism was not a word, but a deed. The God who delivered us from stupid. You know, stupid. And stupid is, stupid is like water. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere you start realizing that your great prayers are not for, but about. Your great prayers are not for something. I rarely ask, now I do ask God for strength. Now that's one thing I do ask him for. My mother told me once, she said, your real issue is not that you don't have strength. You're, you, you don't need to ask God for strength. You need to ask him for the will, <laughs> the will to do it. It ain't strength. God will give you strength. Because I was asking, I said, Mama, pray that I can get up in the morning and have this devotional life like anybody else in the world. She said, I don't need to pray for you to have strength to do that. She said, you got the strength. The problem is you don't have the will. I said, well, now you put it that way. You are right. I don't have the desire to get up at 530 and do all this, that, and other. Because then if I do that, I'm implying my time with God is over. So me and God meet up when I get up. It's like when people used to say, how come we don't have sunrise service on Easter? I said, because Jesus was gone when, at sunrise. So ain't no need to be worried about rushing to get there at sunrise. He was already gone. So we get there at 9 o'clock, he'd still be gone. Ain't no need to rush. And I, and I, 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 I practice a prayer life that represents this constant connection mm -hmm. so that I can, be, I can be taking my walk and getting sermon ideas. I just listen to the Bible, but the Bible app, just walking along, just listening to Scripture. Oh, that's interesting. Let me jot that down. I've got notebooks of just passages like that, that just come like that. Um, and sometimes when you do the study, you realize your initial thought about the passage doesn't match what the historical text is telling you. And that's when you have to go, ooh. Then the question becomes, do you want to still do the work? God gave you the passage, now found what he's saying in it. Um, but prayer life is critical. But it's not always for asking for something. It's more about walk. It's, it's about this daily, constant conversation. The longer you stay with God, the more you realize you have more conversation with him than you really have with anybody else. I've been married for 47 years. Uh, I am a, a full extrovert. But I really do have more conversations with God than I have with anybody. And I don't even try to figure that out. I don't even try to quantify it. I don't try to see if it's too much or too little. No, that's just the way, that's the way we roll. Yeah, that's the way we roll. Darius, what you gonna say here? I have a couple of things, Bishop. Um, let me go back to what Cheryl was asking you and ask her a sense of peace. Um, Dr. Court Wright Davis systematic professor at Howard, shared in class one night, um, talking to preachers, or seminarians might I say, and he was saying how many 
oftentimes if a white person comes into the black experience and you're the preacher, how black preachers will divert from saying what they had planned to say because that white person was in their audience. And he spoke of only one person that he knew of that will say what they had intended to say regardless of a white person coming into the, into the congregation. And he referenced you. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious? I am on holy ground. <laughs> 50 years, as you know, there are books written on pastor burnout. And so you have obviously survived pastoral burnout. So my question is, your personality is, is always, you present always upbeat, you always have a smile. Tell us, and I think you've already shared with us, but is there any other pieces to this puzzle that you would add for us in terms of how you stay grounded in the assurances of God? We got you in the river. We have you with your devotional life, the love of music, your prayer life. Is, is there anything else oh, that yeah. has helped you stay grounded to avoid even the parameters of pastoral burnout? Two things. One, all of us get close to it. We're like the moth, but prayerfully not the moth. We clock, we, moths don't come around like they used to when we were growing up. We fly, we fly close to the flame, but prayerfully, not like Icarus, into the fame. I think, I know I've been there close several times. I remember one time being so close that I felt the strain of it if I were to use a metaphor, being so close, I felt the heat burning my flesh. And it was a passage that spoke to me that defined it. It says, without a vision, the people perish. And I didn't have a vision. And I, could, I understood that was why I was perishing. Because the Bible says without a vision, you will burn out. The Stockdale principle, one that I have um, lived by for years now, Admiral Stockdale was the highest ranking American soldier in Vietnam in the Hanoi Hilton. Um, and during the Vietnam War, his job was there to make sure he kept all the American soldiers alive. And many of them died. But those who died the most, or those who were the first to go down, were the optimists. <laughs> the optimists, the raw optimists were the ones who, were to, who died first. Because they would say things like this, we're going to be liberated by 4th of July. 4th of July would come. We're going to be liberated by Labor Day. They're going to get us out of here by January 1. They're going to get us out of here by Easter. And finally, they gave up. It just, it's Jeremiah's line, if you've run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how will you contend with the horses? Doc, Admiral Stockdale said, and this is the paraphrase. We must never lose, or we must always have an indomitable faith in the future, even while we face the unbearable realities of the present. In other words, you, in order to escape burnout, you can never allow the truth of the coarseness and callousness of the moment to outshine the brightness of the hope you live by. No matter how 
callous it is, and no matter how it grates, and no matter how deep it cuts to the white meat, you cannot lose your faith that there's a bright side somewhere, and you will get that. The optimist who could not accept the brutal facts of the present, the person who cannot accept the fact that my, my David, my father, doesn't treat me like he treats my other brothers, Saul, uh, Demas has really forsaken me. Um, Jesus, Judas has betrayed me. If, he, if they allow that to be their only reality, they're going down. Think about things that have hurt you. Things that you have mourned in the closet about and thought no one saw it when you walked out. Think about it. If that had been allowed to fester in you like a, like a virus in your system, how long would it have been before it had overtaken you and you become septic and died, or bacteria and died? But it was a hope. It was a hope. It was a hope. We shall get out of here. When? I do not know. How? I do not. And I've been there. Building this church. The Wednesday before we move in, we don't have an occupancy permit. And we got 5,000 people invited to come to the service. And we don't have an occupancy permit. <laughs> My friends are saying, I think he bit off more than he could chew. They're not going to go in there Saturday. They're not moving in that building Saturday. And I'm saying, somehow, we will get in that door. I'm saying, it's a wonderful thing to be posterized, catching the touchdown pass with your two feet at the back of the end zone and you're leaning out, catching the ball, and everybody waves with this beautiful catch. And that poster sells for millions. But you also win the game with that arm reached across the goal line <laughs> with the ball in it and all the defenders on your back. And the only thing that crossed the plane was the ball. I said, we will cross that plane on that Saturday morning, and we crossed it. I think, Darius, when we try to live as if there's God's world in ours, we're in for a rude awakening. There's only one world. It's God's world, and ours is in it. Ours is in it, and he has promised to be with us in it. And that's what's kept me from those moments of burnout. And, and even when others are in our midst, in the congregation, um, and you know, sometimes people say to me, seem like, did you know so these people were here? Because it seemed like you were knocking it extra hard. Sometimes God will give you uh, a wisdom beyond what your eyes see, and you'll say things that people need to hear, even though you don't know they're there. But we can't back up off of our black identity because somebody else is in the wrong or because we're trying to make our gospel palatable to a people who haven't had our experience. God knew who he made when he made me. He made a black man, and he said it was good. So there's no need for me to try to be something else, to be good in somebody else's eyes. I went to a black elementary school. I went to a predominantly white junior high, senior high, college. I went to a black, a white graduate school, then a black graduate school, then a white graduate school. God knows all the paths that I, he knows, he knows the way that I have gone. He knows the way all of us have gone. And he made us to go that way because that is the flavor we bring to the soup. 
And when, we, when salt has lost its flavor, it is not good to be used on pork or beef. It's only good to be thrown out. Make sense? Does that answer? Yes. Can I ask another one? Wait. You the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Some years before COVID, you, you preached a sermon, and what remains vivid from that sermon is when you used an illustration being in the gym, weightlifting, when you came to a sticking point. And um, you, you talked about how you were storming heaven with questions to God as it related to doors opening for others and doors that you wanted God to open for you. Transitioning to the thought in the context of weightlifting and the role of a spotter, what attributes do you expect your spotter to possess? that you might in this natural journey, this can't be all spiritual, wow, but in the natural sense, you're able, as, as I heard yesterday, to know that they have your hand walking with you through the valley. I want my spotter to believe in me. I may not look like much or be much. I may not have succeeded at a lot, but I want them to see something in me that lets them know they don't have to do it all. They only have to do enough to get me to believe I can do the rest. They don't have to do it all, but just enough to make me believe I can do the rest. I think that's a theme you just brought me to this a theme in your preaching to all of us to help us to understand just doing enough and then trusting God to do the rest for the rest. Because we live in this reality. Our reality is overwhelming. But we are in his reality. If God is, if God is Lord of all, And he's Lord of realities beyond us. He's Lord of my reality, your reality, yours, 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 and yours. Well, where do all of those exist? In his reality. In his reality. And if he believes in me, and he has assigned you to be with me, then what he wants you to do is believe in me. And God seldom does all the lifting. He does the spotting. He should, because when, it, when it's said and done, he wants you rejoicing that he has made you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made in his image. You're made with his power. You're made, to, you're made to be the head and not the tail. You're made to look up and not down. You're made to let his will flow through you to and for his people's sake. You're, you're a conduit for everything that is his to flow to everybody who needs it. But you got to believe that. And the only way you can believe that is somebody comes alongside of you who tells you, I believe in you. Now, the problem with most people is they won't listen to somebody saying, I believe. They, they have been so accustomed to finding fault in themselves that they aren't open to appreciate someone appreciating the seed in them. They are so busy mourning over dirt that they've never learned to celebrate seed. And so when you come with a cultivating word for seed, they brush it off or don't have time for it or never return to it so that the water never gets on the seed. The seed just dries out from the sun. And I've seen that happen to so many people. 
they just can't receive because they can't see. We um, studied text this morning, jo Joel chapter 3. Interesting passage around verse 8. And in that day, come with me for a minute. And in that day. And in that day, it's going to be a dark day. Because we all are marching toward the final setting of the sun. Speaking of Cathedral and Franklin, you burnt the mortgage there. You built two churches. You preached to multitudes of people across the length and breadth of this country. You are mentor to countless pastors. You're there for sick members. You're there for grieving families. Everybody looks to Bishop Walter Scott Thomas. And how would you want your life story told and or remembered? I got to add this tidbit. One of the things that, that makes my journey good is my family. Um, I always love pulling up to my front door. Always have. Enjoy going home. Home is where the heart is, but home is safe space. And home cultivates what I've what I believe, what I live, and what I hope. Um, and it helps me, home is a place where I can wrestle. I can wrestle in the, the confines of the safety of my family with all of the inconsistencies and incongruencies in my own personality and watch them begin to work their way through with the hand of God. There's a song um, that I listen to whenever that question rises in my mind. And the song says, really talks about how will I be remembered? And what do I want to be remembered for? Did I fill the world with love? Did I fill the world with love? It talks about in the morning of my life, the question that will be asked was, were you filling the world with love? In the afternoon, people, you will ask, or people will say, did you do this? Did you fill the world? But in the evening of life, only you can ask this question. As you end the journey that you have tried to make, now you ask the world, did I fill the world with love? I don't want to be remembered for a son. Though I think no preacher has probably more than five after that evidence of redundancy. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, Doc, it's all. You, you hunt around the frigid fringes, you'll find the same stuff. Um, I don't think I want to be remembered for leading worship and whatever. I want to be remembered for impact. I want to have changed lives. I want to have opened the door to cocoon for folk to enter and exit. I want to have been a chrysalis where folk change. If I can close my eyes at the end of the journey, and know that my impact is greater than my outflow, then I know I'll hear him say, well done. Because he didn't send me to write 800 books. He didn't send me to print 1,000 manuscripts. He sent me 
two fingers and put them under the weights and help that person who can't believe get past the sticking point and tell somebody else, I know somebody who can help you through this. Then my living will not be in vain. If they can have met Jesus that way, I will have done my work and sung my song. Jada? Everyone's talking about mental health now. It's in government. It's in certainly the work that I do. Um, mental health, social emotional learning. Um, and I think you've been talking about mental health for a long time, and not formal mental health or therapy, though I don't think you have a problem with that, but I feel your ministry, I had been characterizing your ministry, so I have an opportunity to have you characterize your ministry. I'm like, it's a, it's a, Bishop is all about um, changing your mind that what has a hold of you is, can't keep you or something. I'm like, he's a spiritual, emotional, mental health ministry of something. Right. Can you... Can you define it so I can finally have it? What are you trying to get us to? When I did my doctoral work, I said to my doctoral advisor, I want to do something on the spirit and the mind. I believe there's a connection between what God is doing in our spirit because it has to work in our mind to translate into our lives. You know, the, the spirit can't just speak to the heart and to the soul because those don't have languages. It has to speak to our mind so that our mind can interpret what changes we need to make. And for me, the greatest battle I fight is in my mind, always. You know, what I, what I face in reality is 10 times worse in my head. What I win in reality can be 20 times brighter in my head. I really believe that that's where most battles are fought that what Jesus does is cast out strongholds that have our mind. Strongholds are patterns that we build and protective spaces that we, we build and erect within ourselves to feel safe and to avoid the anxiety that reality creates for us. And often the strongholds that we built, we build are around falsehoods that we conclude around falsehoods that we conclude. And so therefore, the gospel has to, the gospel, the presence of Jesus and the power of his spirit has to tear those things down so that they can see the light of day. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the spiritual wickedness in high places. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Pulling down these things that are protecting, protecting these man-made ideas that give us a sense of security, even though they may be as whack as all outdoors. A stronghold built around a lie, nobody loves me. You know, I'm not loved. This, here's the great one. And people don't say it, but it's a stronghold built around it. There's something wrong with me. That's something wrong maybe because I don't study well, I didn't do well in school, uh, I had a bad relationship, I seem to get myself in these same kinds of binds. But the conclusion is, there's something wrong with me. And I believe that the God, we always talk about penetrating the heart. Well, you do have to do that. But you also have to pierce the the stronghold of the mind that has gotten somebody believing a lie. I can't make it. Yes, you can. I, can, I, can, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You will. You, God will bring you through this. You're allowing yourself to believe a lie. And part of the persuasion of preaching has to be the taking off of the, the gloves of timidity and put it and, and 
wrapping our hands in the, the boxing wrap of truth and faithfulness to the gospel and then swinging with full force of the spirit to knock that stronghold down. Does that make sense? Because the most, one of the most crippling things, especially in our community, is false perceptions that we have made reality. You know, one of the, the acrostic definitions of fear, false reality, a false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. And it is the work of the preacher to make false evidence appear what it is, false. And what's interesting, we're living in a day and age when we do not know where there is a grounded place of truth. And so we have to hold on to God being that grounded place of truth. Even when others say, well, I don't believe that. Well, it's fine. You know, how's that working for you? <laughs> but I'm standing on this because I'm going home from the party with, with the same person who brought me. You go home with somebody else. I'm standing on the word of God. Make sense? And I, I guess I just had a quick question about, since we're talking about the mind and your trust in God, when, again, we're in this million-dollar building, could you talk a little bit about the moments when trusting God got hard? Because I know, again, you know, and I, I, I guess another part to this question is the times where you wanted to make a move of ministry, but that may not have been God's will concerning you. So that may to, not have been what? Well, yeah, the, the difference between this is something I want to do, but this isn't what God wants me to do when it's actually pertaining to ministry. Well, one thing I've learned, God speaks first. The devil comes behind with plausible alternatives. God will tell you what he wants you to do. Then Satan tells you, well, you can do that if you do it this way. Or maybe you don't need to do this. You just do this. But God speaks first. Th that's an axiom by which I, I live. That, that is a truth I have chosen to make foundation. Somebody said, well, that's not true. It's not true for you. It is foundational for me. God speaks first. Devil comes behind with plausible alternatives. Secondly, we're always growing. And it's a mistake to think that you ever arrived. You'll never get off the train before you're supposed to. You can take your bags down and everything. The train will pull off and you still, I meant to get off. No, the train's always moving. You will get off when you're supposed to. Now, what do I mean by that? All the things that I've been through have been a part of the growing experience. They're all intended for me to grow. They're all intended to have happened. I mean, you name it. My father getting sick, my mother dying, um, major surgeries, a tumor in my throat, um, a, a, a growth in my lung, uh, a growth in my back. But all of that's the train moving. I wasn't supposed to get off. I was supposed to grow through that. Because this is nothing but growth. And when we get to the end of this journey, a new journey begins. The, the, the mystery of modern church is we've forgotten that there's something beyond this. You know, everybody's crying at a funeral but the person who died. You know, they shout, now I'm out of there. I'm awake, I'm God, hallelujah to the last. When we built this church, I remember sitting up in the middle of the bed saying, I'm 60 years old, building a $50 million church. Have I lost my mind? Have I lost my mind? I mean, one problem after another. I remember when I thought God wanted us to buy the building across the street from 4501, not from uh, downtown at 501 Cathedral Street. I thought he wanted us to buy that building. We walked around it seven times like the children of Israel did. No, <laughs> that wall ain't come tumbling down. No. And in fact, I was undone. We could not buy the building. 
We could not buy it. I mean, we were all set, and we could not buy it. I just knew that's what God wanted us to do, but that was not the will of God concerning us. And in just a little while, my brother rides by and drops something in my mailbox. Say, take a look at this. See if this is something you might be interested in. It's 4501 Old Frederick Road. The rest of that becomes history. That was the will of God. Whatever you're dealing with is the will of God concerning you at that moment. I had to realize, okay, that wasn't what God wanted. But it was the will of God that I know that wasn't what he wanted. I could have kept crying when 4501 opened up. But I had to realize, no, that closed so I could realize this was open. You... You have to see everything that's happening to you as a part of the journey. Losing a job, getting a job, buying a house, uh, the mortgage being higher than you expected, mm -hmm. the gas and electric going up, the gasoline bill going up, yet you're still paying your bills. The revelation I had the other week, I was really feeling down. I mean, down, lower than a footprint, down, flatter than a duck's foot. I was down. And I was feeling the way I, because I live in metaphors, so I had a metaphor. I said, I said to a friend of mine, I feel like I'm underwater. And as I'm trying to swim to surface, somebody keeps raising the surface. And I still have higher to swim. You ever had that feeling? I just can't seem to get to the surface. God said, yeah, but what else do you see? What else do you notice? Here's where you have this daily walk. You know, if you're just having prayer time, you got to wait till tomorrow. And then you don't know what God's talking about when he bring it up. He said, but guess what? You haven't run out of air. The water level keep getting raised up higher. But you haven't run out of air. You keep thinking it's about getting to the surface. You're missing the process. You ain't running out of air. So if I keep moving it this week and next week and the following week and the week after that, what will you learn? That no matter where it is, you just keep on swimming. That was revelatory for me. So it's still growing. You're always learning this new stuff as you go up. Does that, does that kind of get to what you were asking? That was very powerful. Bishop, you talk about preparation, being responsible, worship. Those are standard pillars for a new preacher that would see like, oh, yeah, this is what I have to do. This is the blueprint for success. This is the blueprint to get to 50 years. Beyond what the individual preacher may see as your success, how do they balance humility? How would you balance trust and faith? How would you balance confidence in the word that you are preparing and delivering to congregants so that they may know Christ? Interesting. Um... Anybody my age was probably baptized by their mother or grandmother in the river of humility. Child, stay humble. You remember that one? You got to stay humble. Did y'all remember that one? Stay humble. Don't get above yourself. We grew up in the black community. I think that was akin, that was second to good morning. After you heard good morning, and if you succeeded at anything, Stay humble. Stay humble. That, that was part of our, our training and, and development. My future is never longer than to right now. When you asked about the blueprint for success, what you named was not the blueprint for success, but the blueprint. Success belongs, belongs to God. And success is interpreted differently by God. What you named was the blueprint for ministry. I forgot to say this earlier. 
when I started preaching, one of the first things I did was go meet with the minister of music. I said, lay out for me all the songs that people sing in church. I grew up Presbyterian. I didn't know these Baptist songs. I didn't know all this stuff they were saying. I, what is this? I don't know this. So I said, but then sometimes I'd have to go preach in other churches, and I might have to lead the service. And so I needed, I needed to know what people sang. So I started out with a list. I, I had that list the whole while I was at New Shallow. If Dr. Carter put me in charge and I was leading worship and we might need a song, my sheet of paper came right on over. That was part of my blueprint. That was, and so I continue it even to this day. Um, I'm always looking for music. Another part was the study um, and the reading and the, the listening for revelation. I don't think a preacher should write sermons that he or she thinks has great points unless those points are revelatory because it is the revelation that, you, that gives you the sense of authority to speak it. If it's not revelation, it ain't worth speaking. You know, some of the, our preachers got upset probably with Darius in the years because he would be nailing on this. But it's the point you're, it's what you're saying that is revealing something. And you got to believe you, you got something to reveal. Once you're there, you preach with a different confidence. Now, you may lose it the moment you sit down. <laughs> you may shake like a leaf the moment you stand. But when you are presenting it, that truth comes alive in you. And the word we say is becomes incarnate in you. Wow. So that it is not just heard, but it is seen of men. That which we have heard and seen, that word becomes incarnate in you. And you begin to preach it with power. See, this isn't the blueprint for success. This is the blueprint. This is the blueprint. A lot of folk throw the blueprint away and try to do, succeed another way. But you just keep working the blueprint and you will succeed at what God wants done. I know, I was, I was sharing with a pastor. Um, I went to lunch with a pastor who said, I was trying to help with his ministry. And he said to me, he said, you know, I really admire all the stuff you do. I, I would love to one day be where you are. And I, I laughed. I said, you're looking at where I am and you think, oh, you got it. I said, you realize I'm looking at Reverend so-and-so sitting, we're sitting at a table, four seats. He's sitting across from me. I said, I'm sitting looking at Reverend so-and-so. He's not there. I'm just in that imaginary chair. I'm looking at Reverend so-and-so saying, God, he got it. And Reverend so-and-so is looking across the table at Reverend so-and-so and saying, but he the man. He got X, Y, and Z going on. I said, but what you don't realize, Reverend so-and-so is looking at Reverend Smith over that other table. I said, everybody's always looking at somebody. Thinking they got it going on. And quiet is kept. I got to drop this. Ministry is a zero-sum game. So anybody who's got it going on in one area, is trying to get it going in another. Nobody's got it all. Nobody's 100 in everything. And thanks be to God, people basically see where you are close to 100. But every now and then, when you think yourself bigger than you ought to, they get a glimpse of you where you're not. But Z ministry is a zero-sum game. It's a zero-sum game, but you work the blueprint that started in ministry school. When you're reading those texts, you get aha moments. When you're studying the exegesis, you get aha moments. You get an idea. It didn't come from Driver or Paul or John or, 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 or Barclay, William Barclay. It didn't come from Pilar. It, you, you, you got a glimpse of a truth. That's revelation. You write, and as you begin to explore it and expound on it, it comes alive. And you preach with confidence. Now, again, you sit down and you'll be shaking like a leaf. Because now you're in all the stuff you ain't confident about. 
But in this one thing will I be confident. And you stand there. Pete? Here at New Psalmist, there are quite a few of us who've gone through the process of, of uh, coming to the ministry. And, and amongst us uh, six here today, we all have some similarities and some differences. But at the end of the day, you, you took a chance on each one of us based on where we came from, what we presented. Why? Because I believe in you. Because <laughs> I believe in you. Um and I see something in you. And it's not just I see something in you as a Christian. I see something in you that God is fashioning for bigger work. And in order to do that work, there's an authority you have to have. Part of my job is helping you be confident in it and comfortable in it um, and roll as it, make sure you are, and to help you see what you can bring to the table. Um, I, don't, I don't encourage people to make the next step if I don't see nothing. No, no, I ain't gonna do that. No, I don't fatten frogs for snakes. Uh-uh, no. Because if it's, if it's not there, there's too much danger in releasing it. Too much danger in releasing it. Too much danger for others and too much danger for themselves. But when I see it, oh, I know it when I see it. As the old lady said, I may not know how to do it, but I know it when I hear it. I, I know it when I see it in somebody. I remember one person said, you don't see it, do you? I said, no. <laughs> no. No. Uh -uh. I don't see this. I said, somebody else may. And they can help you get there. I don't see it. So chances are, I won't be very helpful in you getting there. Doesn't mean it ain't there. It just means it's not the will of God Concerning me. So that does that answer it, Pete? That that answered both parts of the question. I didn't even ask the second part. <laughs> you answered both parts of it, so I'm I'm good. <laughs> Any last question before we close out? I have one question. Go Bishop. ahead, Devon. Bishop, you've been preaching for fifty years, and you always make references to when you preached your initial sermon. What would Bishop Thomas of fifty years say to, I'm going to say, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas. walking up those yes. back stairs. Yes. What would you tell him now? Knowing your experiences, what would you tell him? You're in for the ride of your life. You are in for the ride of, it, it is not anything you imagine, and it is nothing like what you had planned. But you are in for one ride. You are in for a ride you will greatly enjoy. I would look at that youngster with his semi-platform shoes. Pete, you would appreciate that. I knew you'd appreciate that. I would look with the at fro? him. With the fro? Oh, with my bush. <laughs> I looked at a picture of me Sunday taken the week before my initial sermon. I think I was trying on the suit. And I said, gosh, that was me. You had to pick in the pocket. When oh, you started, Jesus. I said, that was me. That was me. I was, I was about 100 and, let me see, how much did I weigh? 150? I was Joshua size. I was about Joshua size. And I said, Lord, time is, but I would tell that person, don't try to change anything. Don't try to change anything. I believe in the butterfly effect. 
I am who I am. Somebody said, do you have regrets? I don't know if regrets is the word I'd use. Um, there are things I wish I hadn't done, places I wish I hadn't gone, all that kind of stuff. But I don't know if regrets is the word because I don't know if I would be who I am if I hadn't all of those experiences put together. I don't know if you get chicken noodle soup without noodles. I don't know if you get bread pudding without bread. And um, I don't know if you get spaghetti without onion powder in the sauce. Now, I don't know if you put onion powder in it or not, but onion powder in the sauce. Every ingredient is necessary for the flavor you get. And the things that have made me shout, the things that have made me question, the things that have made me cry, make me who I am. I wouldn't be who I am if my mother and father had, weren't dead. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. I wouldn't understand other people's pain if my father, I, I would not appreciate what it means to have somebody come by and say, I'm here for you. If I had needed somebody to come by and say, I'm here for you. And now I try my best to go by. Somebody said, he came by my funeral. Yes, because I know what it feels like and how much you need somebody when that moment hits. But I, could, I wouldn't know that. My family is so small, we could sit at the dining room table and have family reunions. So it's not like somebody dying every week and, you know, I'm getting accustomed to this. No, these moments are rare. When my father died, I was 51. That was 51, yeah, 51. That was my first significant funeral since I was in college. So after he died, there was a learning that took place. and a growing that took place. So many of us have stuff we regret. I would say regret is a word you can use if you feel led to. But I would encourage you to integrate that moment into who you are and be, integrate that moment into who you were so that you can better assess who you are does that make sense? It's a painful process because painful things, regrets and hurts and disappointments and all of that are weighty and cut and are like knives. And they are like weights. But the beauty of weightlifting is that you don't just get stronger because you lift weights. You get stronger because the heavy weight tears the muscle apart and the muscle rebuilds stronger. Lifting weights doesn't make you strong. It's that day you wake up and go, oh, 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 somebody bring me some Tylenol. And you realize the muscles have to re-knit and become stronger. And now you can lift more. I have one last question. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if this is the last, but... Um, in the context of young preachers, young pastors, might I say, who are in the infantile stage of pastoring, who want immediately what a seasoned preacher has taken all of most of his or her life to get to, whether it's a package, most of them want a package. What is your hope for the church? Well, I've got to use an example. James and John's mother came and asked Jesus, can my son sit on the right and on the left? And I think that's, that's the folk who want to jump to the instant top. You know, can, can we be up here now? Can, can we have all of this? And Jesus, I think Jesus probably chuckled. So he said, yeah, if they can go through what I go through. And tomorrow you'll see what it looks like, a cross. I think a lot of folk want the glam, the glitz, and the glitter 
um, unaware of what true ministry costs. The fringe thing, I, was in, I had lung surgery back in 89, and I lay in the hospital, um, and I kept hearing this name all night long, they were calling. It was the name of my surgeon. They were calling him all night long to go to this patient, that patient. And I was there for a couple of days, and I heard his name regularly being called. Now, my, my, my business mind and my medicated mind said, boy, he's probably making a whole lot of money. Because <laughs> they calling him every boy. He got patients. He's he rich. My saved mind said, he probably is. But obviously, he must not be the most important thing. Because he ain't nowhere but here. He ain't there enjoying it. He ain't going on trips. He answering calls. He ain't riding in, he ain't Dr. Strange riding in his major car. Ain't got time for nobody. He's here doing all the, his bank account probably overflowing. But his life is charmed by what he does. I think it is in the what we do. And what is it that we do? We live in the mystery, the wonder, and the awe. It is in that that we work every day. And all these other trappings just happen to come along. Dr. Gardner Taylor put it this way when somebody asked him. Dr. Gardner Taylor's great pastor of Concord Baptist Church in New York. He's dead now. But he was the dean of black preachers. They invited him to this major meeting or a fellowship or something in the evening. And he said he could not make it. All the dignitaries were going to be there. He said he could not make it. And they said, Dr. Taylor, you have to make it. So-and-so is going to be there and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. You, you know you got to be there, that Dr. Taylor went, oh, my friend, my friend. When you have been in the presence of the King of Kings, everyone else pales in importance. <laughs> Until the wonder, the awe, and the mystery grabs folk, all that other stuff will be what entices them. But the people who hear them will realize that there is no revelation. Because what people are ultimately looking for is a way to address their anxiety. And how do they do that? By living in the wonder, the awe, and the mystery that is the kingdom with the king, Jesus Christ. So I've got hope for the church because I'm looking at hope. <laughs> well, how do you, how do we feel? Did you have a good time tonight? Yeah, wonderful. Excellent. Amazing time. Excellent. Thank you. Well, let me say to our friends who shared with us on these nights, <laughs> I hope that this has been exciting for you. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. We're going to be continuing these kinds of conversations, and I hope you'll bounce in on our YouTube channel. Send this to your friends. Share it with some of your friends and loved ones and let them be a part of this exchange. We're trying to do so much to help people understand who the King of Kings is. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is no kingdom like his and he is all that and a bag of chips. I hope that this has blessed you and if it has, send us a note, drop us an email, a text, send something on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, uh, even on Instagram and say that this has been a blessing to you. Until next time, we look forward to seeing you. Keep in mind all the things that we're doing here at New Psalmist. Incidentally, keep in mind our movie night on Friday night. I hope you'll be there for that. We're going to have three movies Friday, tomorrow night, three movies. And I hope you'll share with us on those three movies. They'll be a blessing. One for everybody, for the children, for everybody. The concession start opens at 6.30, and 7 o'clock the movies begin. And I'll see you Sunday morning. I'll be preaching the word, looking forward to seeing you in the house. God bless you.